Good morning, everyone. And uh, for those who observe the Bengali New Year, Shubho Nova Varsho, Happy New Year. Huh? Tamil New Year also. I don't know how to say it in, in, in Tamil. <laughs> but happy, <laughs> happy New Year to everyone. The uh, topic this morning is the one I was supposed to give last week. This is uh, Fit for Becoming Brahmin. This will be a, a short three-part series. It's taken from a phrase that we find in the Bhagavad Gita, Brahma Bhuyaya Kalpate, and specifically to four verses in chapter 18, verses 50, 51, 52, and 53. So I'll begin by chanting those verses and then give the translation. Siddhim prapto yata brahma tatap noti nivodhame samasena eva kontea nishta jnanasya yapara buddhya vishuddhaya yukto dhritiat manam niyam yacha shabda din vishayangs tiaktua ragadvesho vyadas yacha vivikti se vilaghvasi yata vakaya manasaha dhyana yoga paro nityam Vairagyam sambupashradha Ahankaram balam darpam kamam krodham parigraham Vimucha nir mama shanto Brahma bhuyaya kalpate Learn from me in brief, O son of Kunti, how, after reaching perfection in actionlessness, one attains to Brahman, the supreme consummation of knowledge. Endowed with the pure intellect, subduing the body and senses with determination, renouncing the objects of the senses, such as sound and the like, rejecting attachment and hatred, resorting to a solitary spot, eating but little, controlling body, mind, and speech, ever engaged in the practice of meditation, possessed of dispassion, forsaking egotism, power, pride, lust, anger and greed, free from the sense of possession and tranquil. Such a person is fit for becoming Brahman. It sounds daunting, yeah. but don't worry, we're actually in some sense all fit for becoming Brahman. So uh, these verses I find particularly important and this whole concept uh, of how we can attain to Brahman or realize our own true nature. Uh, and it raises various questions also. What does it mean not just to become fit for becoming Brahman, but to become Brahman? Uh, There's a whole concept in knowing Brahman and becoming Brahman. Uh, it brings up a lot of questions. F the beginning, just these philosophical questions, and then the practical questions. How do we go about doing it? So these, these verses are very important uh, with regard to this whole concept of, of becoming Brahman or knowing Brahman or being Brahman. And then what are the practical practices? What are the, the qualities that we have to have uh, to make ourselves fit for becoming Brahman? Fit in the sense that uh, we have the necessary tools, that we have the necessary uh, qualities, not qualifications, qualities, uh, so that we can realize Brahman. Because this question of adhikara, of course, will, will come up here. So we have a long list of things that we have to do, we have to practice and, and acquire virtues and everything, but we also have this, this concept of what does it mean to become Brahman. Now, why is this such a difficult a concept that uh, we're taught that from the very beginning we are Brahman and if we're not we can't become Brahman and if we are Brahman then where's the becoming Brahman a lot of this is a problem with language we, we, we know that but if we are eternally Brahman this is our real nature then uh, what does it mean to become Brahman as if we're not Brahman now and we want to become Brahman 
And this idea, if we say, well, becoming Brahmin really means knowing Brahmin. We have this, the Brahmavit, Paramayabhavati, the knower of Brahmin becomes. It's equally challenging uh, because we're told that Brahmin can never be the object of knowledge. Brahmin is the knower, that the, the subject can never be turned into the object. As soon as it, the subject becomes the object, as soon as the self becomes an object, we've turned it into the ego, and the real self is behind watching. So it can never be objectified that way. Uh, it's not that Brahman is too far away, it's too close to us. It's our very own self, it's always behind watching as ourself, not as somebody else. So what is the meaning of these two things, becoming Brahman? If we say becoming Brahman is knowing Brahman, then what is the meaning of knowing Brahman? Even if we, we are in Brahman, and Brahman is the one who knows, Brahman is the real knower. So these, these questions all come up with this little phrase, and then we get this idea of adhikara. Who is fit, who is qualified, who is able to do it, uh, who has the necessary prerequisites, the necessary uh, character traits, the necessary longing and devotion, uh, all of these questions come under this big topic of, of adhikara. Sometimes it's a question of, of privilege, a question of right, a question of competence, who was competent to study certain scriptures and things. Uh, these are old questions that come up. The beginning of every scripture that, uh, or every commentary uh, to every scripture, the commentator has to include adhikara that who is, who is qualified to even study this particular text. So the very traditional thing, uh, there are four anubandhas, uh, uh, one of these will be this, this uh, adhikara. So who is, who is eligible and who is restricted? So it became a, a little bit of a restricted policy uh, at one time. Now, the question of adhikara differs according to different spiritual paths also. We know that traditionally those who follow the path of jnana yoga or raja yoga, that this is much more stringent, the uh, prerequisites and the qualities that one should have. And when we get to uh, the path of devotion and the path of karma yoga, then practically disappear. We just have to be good people, sincere people, with some longing to realize something higher, lead a good ethical, moral type of life, and uh, everything else is, is secondary. We don't have to have a long list of books that we've read first. We don't have to study with a guru for so many years and all of those things. So there's a, a difference in the spiritual path that we take. The main distinction between this jnana yoga and bhakti yoga is that bhakti yoga, bhakti yoga allows us to start at our present starting point, with our, our present uh, good qualities and bad qualities, with our present poor understanding of who we are. Uh, jnana yoga, we have to start at the very end. We start with this idea, I am Brahman. Uh, we, we don't get any leeway there. In bhakti yoga, we can start with some idea, God is far off, I am, I am God's child, and gradually we get closer and closer, and we have some type of uh, higher understanding, or understanding changes stage by stage. So jnana yoga uh, is very tough that way, and we have to have tremendous and dispassion and renunciation and so many other things like that. So I want to start out this morning and this first session uh, with some of these preliminary questions, and uh, we'll continue the next couple of weeks with more practical things about how we uh, cultivate the different spiritual qualities and uh, the traits that we read about in this, in this verse. So, Brahma Bhuyaya Kalpite, fit for becoming Brahman. There's a phrase that we find in some slight variation in different places in the, in the Gita. Uh, same phrases in chapter 14, this uh, well, chapter, how we transcend the three gunas says, whoever serves the Lord with unswerving devotion and transcends the three gunas is fit for becoming Brahman, the same phrase. And then in the second chapter, we have this, one becomes fit for the attainment of immortality. 
So this, this verb, kalpate, it indicates somehow that we've transformed ourselves or reached the spiritual level where uh, we can go to something higher. We can have some, some higher type of, of realization. We're all capable of it at any stage, but it's not realistic at every stage. We have to reach a certain point where we've developed certain qualities and everything so that we can feel that uh, we're getting close and that one can really say, yes, this person has made himself or herself fit for it. So we, we've already climbed a good number of steps and are getting close. We can even see the roof and uh, we have some conviction and we know that uh, if we continue that we'll get there. So this all included in this, this phrase, kalpate, so that we can say spiritual attainment is somehow inevitable for us at that point. Now we may say that it's inevitable for everybody uh, right now, but we don't know how long it'll take. But if we reach that point where we can say, yes, now one is, is qualified to have some type of higher uh, realization, then we know that uh, we've, we are on the right path and we have to just continue with some sincerity and some seriousness and some sense of urgency and we can have that higher type of, of realization. Now we get to this, this idea of becoming Brahman and for me it is more of a problem of, of language. We know what it means. We know that we're not uh, turning ourselves uh, from a caterpillar into a butterfly. There's some transformation that takes place, but we know we're realizing our own true nature. There's no real change from that higher uh, point of view. And uh, really the emphasis on, on Brahman, if we're talking about what is it that we're becoming or what is it that we're knowing, is that it's unknowable. Not simply that it's the, the subject, never an object, but its nature is such that we can't say anything very definite. Iti korajaina, Taku uses this, we can't say it's this or that. We have a very nice phrase from the Upanishads, yato vacho divartante aprapya manasasa, is a, a, a type of definition of Brahman, which says, what is Brahman? It is that from which speech returns together with mind after having been unsuccessful in attempting to catch hold of Brahman. Is the definition of Brahman, that from which uh, speech and mind come back. Sometimes we, we hear baffled, unable to, to know something beyond mind and speech. And of course, Ramakrishna emphasized this so many times, that what Brahman is, we cannot say. He used to humorously say that uh, Brahman is the only thing that is utshishta, that has been defiled by the tongue, that has not been defiled by the tongue, sorry. The only thing, everything else, we can put into words. Put into words means it touches the tongue somehow. This was, uh, he, he told this to Vidyasagar one time, and Vidyasagar was a great scholar. He said, oh, what a wonderful thing I've, I've heard today. Now, I remember years ago, uh, I was reading this Tabakatamaratam. This is a commentary, a series of, of lectures, actually commentaries, uh, on the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna by Swami Lokeshwarnandaji. And there's actually a Sanskrit verse about this Uchishta, a very nice verse. It's Uchishtam Sarva Shastrani Sarva Vidya Mukhe Mukhe No Chishtam Brahmano Gyanam Avyayam Chetanamayam. All of the scriptures and all of the fields of knowledge have become defiled by the touch of many tongues. Only the knowledge of Brahman is undefiled since it is unchanging and of the nature of pure consciousness. So how do we know that Brahman at all? We know it by analogy and similes and things. And uh, Sri Ramakrishna, he emphasizes this idea that we only get a hint. We only get a hint that if we, if we take any of the illustration, the Brahman is like the sun, and it's reflected in the container of water. Yes, it gives us a little bit of a hint, but 
The, the sun is something that actually has rays that can come out, it can strike against something. It's not a perfect analogy. If we talk about the waves and the ocean. None of these are perfect analogies, so we use this term, anupama, for Brahman, that there's nothing, no comparison that really works for it. These are all helpful, but they don't really work. So Sri Ramakrishna says, it's like asking somebody who's never tasted ghee, what does ghee taste like? And they, what does ghee taste like? Ghee tastes like ghee. Well, what? <laughs> you know, so many people, other things, they say, yeah, it tastes like chicken, but we don't know it. <laughs> yeah, if, uh, uh, if we've never experienced it, there's nothing else that we can say that it's similar to, because it's unique. It's the only, only thing. See, we have two categories in this world, Brahman and everything else. Now, we can reduce everything to Brahman, of course, but uh, this is the one thing that uh, we can't say anything about. We can say Satchitananda and other things, but these are just for, for our benefit somehow. Uh, it's that which uh, is perfectly pure and perfectly empty and perfectly full at the same time. We use these types of words, but uh, what it really is has to be experienced because we are that. This is the whole point of this. We have to become that in some sense or realize that, that that is our own real nature. So this is the problem with understanding the term Brahman. Now, this idea of becoming Brahma Bhuya. The Sanskrit language, like many languages, Spanish, other languages, English, there are two different verbs usually for being. One is us to be or to exist, really, and the other, who, to be or to become. One, one always represents that which is essential and unchanging, and the other that which is, is developing and, and, and becoming. So we get terms like uh, asti, asti bhati priya, existence, asti sat, satya, uh, truth, existence, things like that. And then for who, we'll get things, bhava, this changing universe, Bhuta, that which once existed, or the past, or ghost, huh? Bhutas, yeah. And uh, Bhavya, that which will exist in the future. So this juxtaposition of the two terms, Brahman and Bhuya, this form of, of Bhu to become, uh, at first looks like a real contradiction in terms. There should be no becoming of Brahman. If we're the Brahmin, then it's Asti. Then we always are, we always have been, we'll never be anything other than that. So uh, what does it mean to become Brahmin? So this, this distinction between being and becoming, again, this is more uh, just a problem in, in terminology. But as I say, generally this, this uh, with regard to the highest reality, there's no becoming, there's, there's no change in it. It has to always be what it always was at all times. We have the very important verse on chapter 2. One of the lines, na sado vidyate bhavo, na bhavo vidyate sata. If something is unreal, it can never come into existence. And if something is real, it can never cease to be real. So uh, what is this idea that we're not Brahmin and we're going to become Brahmin? It doesn't make any sense at all. But as I say, this is really uh, just a problem with language because we know what's really meant here. So uh, this idea of becoming Brahman, we shouldn't take it to mean that it's something other than ourselves. We are that. This transformation will take place only within the mind, uh, again, with this idea of, of, of realization. So basically what we're doing is we're trying to realize that which we always were from the very beginning. So this is, this is more or less uh, that idea that this Brahman, which is unknown and unknowable, is really our very own self. It's the eternal subject that it can never be turned into an object. So if, if we're willing to say becoming Brahman really means knowing Brahman, then this is that same problem, a problem with, with language, that everything else can be an object of knowledge, but the subject can never be an object of knowledge. Subject always remains. 
that uh, the eye can never see itself, is always standing behind, that this is uh, uh, the, the very nature of Brahman as the self, as the higher self, that it's always, it's always watching us and observing us. And, and to think that we can know it is to think that if, if we could only spin around fast enough, we could see the back of our heads. That is just, it, it's, it can't be done. It's, it'll never be turned into an object, no matter how fast we are. No matter how strong we are, we can never lift ourselves off the ground. If we fall on the ground, we can lift ourselves up to stand up. But then we can't, it's a, just a, an impossibility. But that doesn't mean that there's no sense to this idea of, of knowing Brahman, because we come to the realization that we are that. This is the only sense that it makes to say that now, uh, we know what Brahman is, that uh, uh, it's that ultimate reality which is, is our very own self. Yeah, there's a very nice verse from the Ken Upanishad. Ya chakshushana vashyati yena chakshunshi pashyati tadeva brahma tvam vidhi nedam yadidam upasate that which cannot be seen by the eye, but by virtue of which the eyes see. Know that to be Brahman, and not what people worship here in the world, that is, as some type of personal God separate from us looking down on us. So it's really what knowing Brahman is knowing the self as our very own uh, real eye. We know it through this very, uh, feeling of awareness. Again, there's a more problem uh, with, with language, but we understand it uh, to be ourselves as the witness of all the different states of consciousness, waking state, dreaming state, dreamless sleep state, even the state of samadhi, turiya state, that this, this eternal I that has always been there watching, this is Brahman, and knowing that Brahman means knowing that I am Brahman, that that is my real nature, that is not something separate from me. So this is that direct realization of Parokshana Bhuti that the Gita is really talking about. How do we reach that stage where uh, we're just on the verge of being able to break this false identification with this lower self, with this ego self, with the body, mind, and the senses? And uh, how do we know that? Uh, which is the ultimate knower? Well, because it's knowledge itself, and we are that. It's who I am, Prakasha. We don't have to uh, illumine that. It's self-luminous. And uh, uh, we know the existence of light without ever being able to see light. How do we know the light is on in the room? Because we can see objects. So we can say, where is this consciousness? That it, it's empty, it has nothing in it, only the witness because we experience the world, because we can think thoughts, we can have memories, we can have perceptions and everything, but w w wouldn't be possible without that light of consciousness. So uh, just the mere fact that we experience this world is proof that the consciousness is there, allowing experience to take place. So this whole concept of becoming Brahman by knowing Brahman it's very much like Swamiji's statement. Swamiji, one of his most famous statements, if we really want to pick it apart, also doesn't make any sense at all. Each soul is potentially divine. One of his most famous statements, one of his most beautiful statements, that why does he say that? I used to wonder, why did he say that? Each soul is already divine. There's nothing potential about it. It's absolutely divine from the beginning to the very end. But Swamiji knew that, of course. What he was saying was that each individual has the potential to realize that. So uh, it, it's, it's a statement that sounds a little odd, but it's a brilliant statement. And is really emphasizing uh, this idea that all of us have that ability to, to realize this very highest type of, of truth, each soul. So in terms of this adhikara, we'll get to that, no restriction. You don't have to belong to any particular uh, community or, or caste or, or gender, anything like that. That this is something that is open to everybody if we can become qualified for it. So 
it's not exactly a question of privilege, a question of, of qualification. So when Swamiji said that, he was not saying that this is, there are some souls that aren't divine but potentially divine, that he's expressing this very obvious truth that we don't know who we are. We don't know our real nature. Uh, we take ourselves to be just a combination of the elements and everything. We don't know that divinity, which is our real nature. So he's telling us that uh, you, each and every one of you, he's telling everybody, that all of us, that uh, this is within our grasp, that we can have this, this realization. Why can we have this realization? Because it's true already. It's true already that we are, we're already divine, we're already perfect, and nobody can take that away from us. Or it's not that we have to uh, accomplish that. It's already accomplished. We have to realize it, that's all. So each and every one of us is capable of having that realization of our own divine nature. So this is really what Swamiji is saying, and that there are different paths that we can all follow for that. So now I want to get to this question of fit for becoming Brahman. What does it mean? What does it mean to become fit? What does it mean to, be, to become uh, qualified? And this gets us to this term, adhikara. This question of adhikara, who has the competence and therefore the right to seek for the knowledge of Brahman, to strive for God realization, to strive for liberation, uh, even to, to uh, strive for, uh, for devotion and love, any type of, of a higher state, some type of state of, of perfection, siddhi, some type of state of perfection, however we understand it. And this is a very complicated issue, this question of, of adhikara. It was at one time a very a formal type of question, and there were very orthodox schools who really wanted to restrict uh, who could study the scriptures, who would have access to it. Uh, it was really a kind of privilege. It was kind of a club. that uh, Some were privileged, that means others are, are debarred from it. So this is that idea that uh, very o some orthodox traditions that only Brahmins, only boys, young boys will go into the forest with the guru and everything, that they're qualified. This Adhikaravada, it even said that uh, unless one is a, a Brahmin, one can't become a sannyasin. When the Swamiji travels through South India, uh, that was even questioned. He didn't come from a Brahmin family, so he was called Shudra Sannyasi, uh, which is, uh, means not really a sannyasi. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is that very orthodox position. Now, Shankaracharya, he comes from the orthodox tradition. We can't really fault him too much, but uh, Swamiji, that was the one thing. Swamiji loved Shankaracharya, uh, really. And uh, his, his philosophy, Swamiji really thought was the highest. But he could never quite forgive him for this, this one thing, this adhikara business. He used to compare him to Buddha, he said, whose heart was open for everybody. But anyhow, he, he came from, that, uh, from that, uh, that tradition. So Swamiji, we know, is the champion of the underprivileged, anybody who was exploited, anybody who uh, uh, had to suffer from uh, the privileged class, not allowing them to do things. Swamiji, he has uh, some beautiful lectures on privilege that he gave in London in Jnana Yoga. They're some of my favorite uh, lectures. So for Swamiji, everyone was Amrathya Putra, that everyone was a child of, of immortal bliss. Everyone has this uh, uh, possibility and, and right, and right to strive for God realization, any means possible. So we're all heirs to that, that throne of the king. The, the, and Sri Ramakrishna used to use that type of, of language. And uh, why is that? Because we carry that treasure within ourselves, everybody. Yeah, there's no restriction from that point of view. We all have that within us, but it's hidden deep within, and we have to strive to realize it. We have to go uh, be beneath the surface of the mind. Uh, we have to find the key for that treasure chest. So uh, we all have the right to, to try to do this, 
And uh, the inevitability of it happening is based on the fact that, that we carry that within, that we, we do have that perfection, that uh, we are one with this ultimate uh, reality. So this was a great theme in, in Swamiji's life, and he had a great hatred for this idea of this adhikara, that uh, uh, some should have some special privilege. It's really a question of, of uh, uh, what works best for us. So this adhikara has this other meaning, a very nice, beautiful meaning, that uh, uh, what are we qualified to follow as a spiritual path that will be best for us? So. Here is Swami Krishna, he has these two phrases that he uses very often, ruchi bheda, that what appeals to us, and then hajam shakti, what can we digest? So there will be some who uh, are attracted to a particular spiritual path, but uh, they can't really, it doesn't really work for them very well. We have several cases that we know of. One is Vijay Krishna Goswami that somehow uh, he was attracted to the Keshav and to the Brahma Samaj and was practicing this path of uh, uh, the impersonal absolute reality that could be looked upon as a kind of father figure, but uh, there could be no worship of uh, any image or anything like that. And a uh, little bit, this Ruchi was there. He liked it on, to a certain extent, but it wasn't something that he could really digest the way he could, the full devotional type of path. So Sri Ramakrishna knew that. And uh, th there are other instances like that. So uh, not a question of the not qualified for it, but a question of there are other paths that will be better for us. That's all. A very simple type of thing that uh, it has to appeal to us, but we also have to have that power to digest it. So these were the two cri criteria that uh, Sri Ramakrishna always spoke about. If we look at the Kattu Upanishad, the story of Nachiketa and Yama. Now, he is a, uh, a Brahmin boy, and because he had to wait uh, three days before Yama could come and, and receive him cordially, he was granted three boons. We see Yama, uh, who was more powerful than Yama, but he's a Brahmin boy. They give so much respect for that, that he gives him three special boons. But when he wants to know about the highest knowledge, knowledge of, of the self, then this other question of adhikara comes. Is he really qualified for it in the sense that uh, does he care for this more than anything else? So we know that he gets tempted uh, by all sorts of uh, uh, wonderful types of enjoyments in heaven and different types of things. And uh, uh, after he refuses all of them and says, no, I only want to know what is the real nature of the self, then Yama knows that he's qualified for it. So it wasn't automatically he's a Brahmin boy, he can get the highest knowledge. This other type of qualification uh, really turns out to be uh, the most important. So, uh, as I was saying, the path of bhakti yoga, really there's not much. We have to be very sincere. We have to have longing uh, for some type of union with God, some faith in that. We have to lead at least a good moral ethical type of, of life. But the path of knowledge, it requires a certain understanding of our own true nature. Path of knowledge traditionally meant uh, hearing the truth of the scriptures, which meant the Mahavakya, which generally meant Tattvamasi. This is the standard explanation we get. This Tattvamasi, uh, then we meditate on it, and we have to uh, go deep within until we have that realization. But at the very beginning, we have to know what is the real meaning of the different phrases within it. So what is the real meaning of Tvam, you? So if I say that, yes, this is who I am, I'm so-and-so, born of this uh, parents, and, and uh, I live in this uh, uh, city and all of that, and I said that that is one with a the Brahmin, then of course it, it is not possible. I have to know the real nature of, of tat, the real nature of tvam. 
If I think tat refers to personal God in heaven, then how am I that? If I think even that it's Ishwara, creator of the universe, then how am I that? I can't create this, this universe. So Sri Ramakrishna gives that nice example. Yeah, I, the wave belongs to, to the Ganges. Ganges doesn't belong to the wave. That I can't say that, yes, I'm the one with that personal God. I have to say, uh, if I have the proper understanding that the sense of I that I have is wrong, that I'm really this pure consciousness, this feeling of Brahman, that Brahman is some creator, some, some place far off, watching down on me, that I'm also not that, that this Brahman is also pure consciousness. So we have to start out with a, a very subtle type of understanding if we want to practice that. Otherwise, we go around saying, I am God, well, it's, and this ha happens. It's complete nonsense and very destructive, very harmful type of thing. Ishwaro hum, hum bhogi. We have this, this expression once in the Bhagavad Gita as the worst possible example of somebody suffering from the horrible pride, thinking, yes, I am such a big, strong, powerful person. Yeah. So those who understand this tatvamasi, they'll have some tremendous type of, of uh, humility in order to do that. So this uh, adhikara uh, for this path of knowledge, one part of that uh, is that we don't identify with this body. This, this is one of the things we find uh, chapter 12 on Bhakti Yoga. This avyakta hi gadir dukham deha vadvir avapyate. That this klesha adhikara, the, it's much more difficult to follow this why for those who deha vad, it has two meanings. It can mean those who possess a body and Shankaracharya says, uh, no, not simply that, one who is, those who are identified with the body. Now, I don't find much distinction. Uh, who is not identified with the body? Uh, we all have a body, and we're all identified with it to a certain extent. But those who have less sense of identification, or those who have some sense of themselves as the, the witness, then they can follow this. So it's not that others are told, no, you can't do it. That you can have the same realization, but it's klesha. It's, you, it'll be more troublesome. It'll be more difficult. That's all. So again, it's not a question of, of uh, uh, restriction. The, this is a privilege for only a few, but uh, the question of, of it'll be more difficult if we follow a path that uh, is not suited to us. So this is the challenge for uh, the path of, of knowledge, that we have to start out uh, with a very uncompromising point of view, and we have to have tremendous dispassion and uh, not much identification with the body and look upon the world a little bit as a passing show. And this is why the adhikara for this jnana yoga was generally restricted to sannyasins that traditionally they were the ones, not always, of course, all these young boys are learning it and everything, but uh, they would be the ones that were considered more qualified to follow the path of knowledge. Now, if we look at the direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, aside from Swamiji, and he almost forced Swamiji to follow this path to a certain extent, uh, in general, uh, he said the path of devotion, the path of devotion is easier it's not all that easy, of course. It's easier. So it's not a question that uh, the others are not qualified or capable, but we should follow the path that's, that's the path of least resistance. This was the phrase Swamiji used to use. The path of least resistance, that which will be uh, most helpful uh, for us. So this path of, of devotion uh, we find for most people is something uh, and natural. Why is it natural? Because we get to use all of our emotions. We get to use all of the emotions that we understand through family relationships. We know what it's like to be a, a child and to have a mother. We know what it's like to have friends. We know what it's like for a mother to have a child. Uh, these, these emotions are things that can be used. And the second thing, which I mentioned earlier, is we can start uh, we can start out 
uh, with some dualistic idea. We don't have to start out with any deep philosophical understanding that, uh, yes, I'm really worshiping my own self, something like that. Uh, uh, gradually, these things will, will uh, develop within our minds that we'll start to understand these things. Swamiji, talking about bhakti yoga, he says, we always begin as dualists on the path of devotion. God is a separate being and I am a separate being. Love comes between and man begins to approach God and God, as it were, begins to approach man. Man takes up all the various relationships of life as father, mother, friend, or lover. And the last point is reached when he becomes one with the object of worship. I am you and you are I. And worshiping you, I worship myself. And in worshiping myself, I worship you. So uh, this was also uh, Sri Ramakrishna's uh, explanation that uh, we reach the same goal through the path of devotion as we do through the path of, of knowledge. But it's an it's a easier path and gradually as we, as we ascend, we ourselves change. Whereas the path of knowledge, we're told that we start at the very end. The beginning and the end are one and the same. We have to start with this uncompromising view that I'm one with that ultimate reality. So this adhikara for the path of devotion uh, only requires a little sincerity, only requires a little bit of longing and uh, a path of knowledge, tremendous, this what we call viveka and vairagya, uh, very sharp intellect can distinguish things and this kind of really burning type of renunciation, dispassion uh, for the world. So uh, if we're asking ourselves, what do we really have to do to make ourselves fit? We have that long list and we'll go through that long list. If we think that we have to accomplish all of that before we become qualified, then it's impossible. We can't do it. And many of the things that are said there uh, only take place after God realization. So what does it mean? It means that we have to gradually try to follow these things, that uh, uh, we have to have a desire to uh, give up all of our attachments, a little desire to go beyond all of the passions and a and, uh, little desire to lead a good, pure type of life. So this is the main thing. This is, Sri Ramakrishna talked about Vyakulata, that doesn't happen uh, uh, except in very rare cases and at the very end. But we need at least this uh, longing for uh, somehow transcending this ordinary type of life that we have. It's not going to be like we're, we're, our heads are underwater and we're gasping for a breath of air. That is not going to happen for most of us. But at least we should have that, that feeling that uh, Something there's something to be accomplished in this life, and I want to do it. And this is the most important thing to me. So this is this is all this adhikara, and uh, this will make us fit for at least uh, starting this this spiritual journey. We're all qualified to have that realization. Nobody's barred from that. Nobody is is banned from that, debarred from that. Everybody is is qualified. But uh, can we do it ourselves? We have to, now we have to make some attempt. That treasure that's hidden within, we can't just say that, yeah, I have it within, I am that. We have to dive deep. We have to find the, the treasure box. We have to find the key. We have to unlock it. Yeah. So we, we have, the onus is on us. We have a lot of things that we have to do. So when we, when we look at these, these qualities in the Gita, as I say, they seem very daunting, and we may question ourselves. Really, the whole purpose of this talk is that uh, none of us should feel that we're not qualified. We hear this very often. We hear people say that, uh, how can I uh, possibly hope that I can realize something in, in spiritual life? I know how attached I am to this and that. I know these bad tendencies, that I get angry too easily, that. Uh, 
I, I well, criticize people. I, I see all these things. And how can I talk about being qualified to realize God? We have to understand that uh, none of us is perfect. And if, if, we, if we have to take that first step, and we should never uh, cultivate any type of a poor image of ourselves. Sri Ramakrishna was very much against this idea of saying, oh, I'm a sinner, I'm a terrible person, I can't do this, I can't do that. We see so many times that uh, in conversations, uh, especially uh, there are a certain class of devotee that likes to say, oh, I'm a sinner, I'm a terrible sinner, as a type of humility. And Sri Ramakrishna used to say, that wretch who keeps saying I'm a sinner will become a sinner. That means that that will become ingrained in the personality. And he said, why not say I've taken the name of God once? That should be enough to burn off a whole lifetime of sins, to be very positive about that. So uh, we should all understand that there's no restriction, that uh, there's no privilege for a chosen few, and not that, oh, this is only for the monks, not for the householders. The, the, this is not true at all. Maybe for the path of, of, of knowledge that uh, it'll be a little bit more reserved for a certain type of person, but we have to understand that uh, all of this is a question of degree, that some of us are a little less detached, a little more detached, that some of us are a little free from anger more than others, but we all have to learn to, to cultivate all of these things and understand that to reach perfection in all of those qualities that we read, in the, the, these few verses uh, is impossible without some really higher type of experience. This is, this is a, another paradox in spiritual life that uh, unless we attain to some state of, of a calmness and uh, freedom from doubt and conviction and everything, we won't have realization. And without realization, we won't become free from, from doubt and attain. It, it sounds like a terrible paradox but what it means is that uh, we strive for all of these things and we reach a point where uh, we're just at the final step before we get to the roof. And then some grace comes and then after that uh, some real transformation takes place. So there's transformation going up and then there's transformation afterwards. So if we want to say that uh, in order to uh, lead a spiritual life, we have to be free from doubt. True to a certain extent, that we have to have faith in the path that we're following and everything, but doubts won't completely leave until we have that ultimate realization. So uh, the different type of, of uh, uh, experience, change, transformation that takes place after realization. So we start out with a desire to be qualified for whatever path that we want to follow to, so we can begin this spiritual journey to strive for some type of attainment and know the transformation will take place uh, if we're sincere and if we, if we really try to uh, follow the path that we're on. And we recognize the tremendous value that comes from all of these qualities and practices that are mentioned in these few verses and, and we'll go through them uh, in, the, in the next couple of, uh, of sessions. Uh, but really, this, this desire to lead a spiritual life is the only thing that has to be there. And if we're wishy-washy about things, good, we can lead a good life. But if we, if we really want to talk about attainment of some type, then uh, we, we have to have uh, some deep-seated longing for realization, for desire, for, for union with God, something like that. And again, we have to, at the minimum, we have to lead a, a good type of life. We have to be unselfish, kind, caring people. That these are the minimum uh, qualifications that we have. So this fit for becoming Brahmin, uh, it'll, it'll develop into becoming ripe for becoming Brahmin. And then we're really at that final rung. We get to the very top. Sri Ramakrishna calls this Arunodaya, that we see on the early morning a little pink color that comes up in the, in the horizon, and we know that within a very short time the sun will come up. So uh, in, in spiritual life, uh, we go through these different, uh, different stages, and uh, if we're, again, if we're very sincere, 
and uh, through the grace of God, of course, that uh, we're able to reach that stage, and then we'll have that ultimate realization. But the main point is, what I, what I really want to emphasize is that uh, we're all heirs to this treasure. That there's nobody debarred from it. Nobody can take it away from it. It's uh, from us. It's it within our very own hearts. Only we have to dive deep. And uh, the whole point of this is that uh, we're given the means to do it. We're given some very some beautiful advice on how we do it. And we'll get to that in the next a couple of sessions. <laughs>